Okay, so it is March 27th, 2014, and we're at the Central Library in Brooklyn Public Library. Uh, we are interviewing Donald Fraser McIver, uh, whose birth date is? October 31st, 1946. And by the way, it's uh, actually Donald Fraser McIver, Jr. Jr., sorry about that. No, it, I usually don't use it since my father's deceased. But. Okay. Um, and I am Judy Camelor. I work for Brooklyn Public Library's coordinator of older adult services. Um, so I'd like to ask the war and branch of service. The Vietnam War, United States Army Special Forces. And what was your rank? Sergeant First Class E7. And where did you serve? I served in, uh, in training and then uh, and then uh, in, in my first uh, unit assignment at uh, various forts in the United States, uh, mainly Fort Bragg, North Carolina for Special Forces. Okay. And, then, and then later in Vietnam. Great. Okay. Um, were you drafted or did you enlist? I was sort of both. Hmm. I was drafted and then went ahead and enlisted. Okay. And what, what made you decide to do that? I was a, a student at the University of Texas, <clears throat> a pre-med student in Austin, and uh, I got very involved in um, a United States uh, U.S. Senate campaign for John Tower, who was the first Republican senator since uh, Reconstruction in the South. <clears throat> was the executive vice president of the University of Texas Young Republicans, 1,500 members, and I also was in charge of the precincts around the university. Uh, for his campaign. I also was working at the uh, Republican State Headquarters as a mail clerk part-time, which uh, was not just carrying around the mail, but doing printing and putting out their magazine every month and all of that kind of stuff, setting up things for their state conventions and committee meetings, all that. So um, at the end of the campaign, John Tower won. And so I uh, asked the executive director and staff members and also people who work for Senator Tower told them I'd like to go to Washington, D.C. and work for the senator. They hired me. This was in um, very early 1968, 1967. And um, a week later, my mother called me. I was living at home in Austin. <clears throat> My mother called me and said, there's a letter here from the President of the United States. And it said, greetings. You're invited into the armed forces of the United States. So what I did is I went down. I had been reading a lot about the Green Berets. And I knew that I wanted to serve my country. Almost a year before I'd gone in voluntarily into the, into the Army with a friend. And I sort of chickened out at the last minute. I said, well, I'll, I'll just stay in school. But what happened at the University of Texas was I was taking a very heavy uh, pre-med course load, including comparative vertebrate anatomy and calculus and physics and, and uh, organic chemistry. Well, I ended up flunking organic chemistry. Uh, never understood it, still don't. Um, and uh, so I, I was put on scholastic probation and had to sit out for a month or for a semester. Well, my draft board was up in Amarillo, and they were, they were drafting dogs off the streets because they didn't have enough people. So as soon as that, I went off that S classification with the Selective Service, they immediately put me as, as 1A. So they grabbed me. People said, well, why don't you go to Senator Tower and, and try to keep out of the service? I said, look, I said, Tower is one of the big hawks on this war. I said, I want to serve my country, and I'm not even going to go there. So I went down to all the, all the recruiters, the Marine Corps, the Navy, the Air Force, the Army. All of them were a four-year enlistment except the Army. And when you're only 20 years old, three years or four years out of your life, that's a long time. And so the Army was three years, and it also had the opportunity that if I went in, I could possibly qualify for the Green Berets. And so what I did is I went ahead and enlisted in the Army. So I took the extra year, and also in order to be a Green Beret, you had to be in for three years because you're, you're like me, my, uh, I trained for almost two years. My basic load of courses lasted for 18 months. 
and then I took uh, three months of Vietnamese language course before I went to Vietnam. Um, so I'll tell you later how I how I volunteered to go to Vietnam after I trained. But okay. So that that's a long expl explanation. Very interesting. Um, okay, so you talked a little about why you picked that service grant. Tell me about your fascination with Green Berets. Like, when did that start? Actually, it started in the, in the 1960s when I was in high school. I was uh, uh, I graduated uh, from Tascosa High School in Amarillo in uh, 1964. Around that time, <clears throat> you first heard about the Green Berets from John F. Kennedy. Uh, in 1961 or 1962, he went on a tour of uh, Fort Bragg, and he met with uh, General uh, Yarborough, who was a one-star general. There was always only one star in the Green Beret, Special Forces. Uh, people say you aren't a, a Green Beret, you're actually a Special Force member, you know. Um, the Special Forces for years has been trying to get the Green Beret as an official headdress, like they, like they wore it, uh, like the uh, British uh, uh, Marines, uh, and, then, and then other elite forces in Europe. So they wore it unofficially, and uh, Kennedy went back to Washington and designated as an award for anyone who made it through Special Forces training. It's the only it's the only headgear I think that was ever authorized as an official. Uh, he called it a badge of courage, mm. and so that's why a green beret is so special. Once you put that on your head, you never want to lose. Mm. So <clears throat> um, after that, Kennedy, when he was assassinated in 1963, there have been some articles in in the magazines about. Um, about Green Berets, uh, and periodically, and then in 1964, Roger Donlin uh, was the first recipient of the Medal of Honor in Vietnam, uh, and he was a Green Beret. I still have the Saturday Evening Post uh, magazine with his picture on the front of it, on the front cover. Mm -hmm. And when I was in Washington last week for the Medal of Honor ceremony, I saw Roger Donlin again down there, and I mentioned that to him. Um, first, I said it was a Look magazine. He said, "No, Don, it's the Saturday Evening Post." But I said, "I have it, <laughs> you know." And I've seen him in many conventions. But anyway, then, then when Kennedy was assassinated, uh, here I am in Amarillo, and I think we only—I'm not sure—we had three networks in Amarillo, uh, and, and black and white TV. I only had one friend with the color TV. So I'm sitting there late one night. And uh, you know the TV would go off at 10 o'clock or 10:30, and they would they would play the Star Spangled Banner and show the planes flying, the jets flying overhead, and then you got the big eye, you know, at, at midnight or whatever. So I'm sitting up late watching uh, the newscast on on Kennedy's funeral, and and there were cameras in the rotunda of the Capitol up on one of the higher levels and aiming down at the casket. And it said, I can't remember the, who the commentator was that night. Um, and so I'm a senior in high school, my first, first uh, half of the year in high school. Had just turned 17 years old. No, I just turned 18, because I started to, high school, uh, senior year at 17. But anyway, so I'm, I'm looking at that and it said, tonight, rather than the traditional honor guard of the different services, these are members of the United States Army Special Forces known as the Green Berets. Um, guerrilla warfare and counterinsurgency operations. And I said, I want to be one of those guys. Oh. And um, so that was in the back of my mind all this time. And uh, so 1964 to 1967, so it was two and a half year, years later, I had a green braid on my head. Wow. Um, okay, do you recall your first days in service? Absolutely. <laughs> you want to tell me about them? Um, 
Yeah, on my on my, I was living in Austin, Texas, living at home, uh, going to school. Um, um, my sister was was married and living in Dallas, and uh, then I, I was living there with two younger brothers and my and my parents. <clears throat> on my youngest brother, on his twelfth birthday, I got on a bus to go down to San Antonio, which is eighty miles south of Austin to be um, enlisted. Uh, that's where you're sworn in and then they, they give you a medical checkup and all of that stuff. Uh, and, um, and, then, uh, and then they start giving you tests. Uh, it was a real, real long session because later in the day they put us on like a DC-3 aircraft I'd never been in a commercial aircraft before, but they flew us to Fort, Fort Polk, Louisiana. All through the night, we didn't leave until late at night, and so we arrived like at two or three o'clock in the morning. We go to these barracks that are World War II barracks that were supposed to be torn down after the war. Um, and um, we're, get, we're issued uh, bedding and I think uniforms, we thought we were going to get to go to sleep. Well, no, we didn't. I, I can't remember how long we were up, probably at least 36 hours by this time. And they had us go into rooms and we had to take all of these tests, like 12 different tests. On, um, Sorry. We can do it in the dark. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oof, that was, shouldn't have said that. Um, so, um, yeah, they, they lined us up outside in the morning, and they started going through everything that you brought. Uh, and even like I had um, some uh, athlete's foot uh, cream, and they threw that away. And they, I said, look, I need that for my athlete's foot. And they said, no, go to the dispensary, and they'll, they'll give you some more. So they were, they were taking everything away. And, and I was standing next to this uh, young, young kid from Mississippi. His name is Quitman Lockley. He was from Meridian, Mississippi. Cute kid with that real southern accent. And he and I have been friends since 1967. And we always call each other on Christmas Day. His, his young daughter, who's graduating from Miss, uh, University of Mississippi Law School this spring, she always used to say, well, Daddy, do you think MacIver will call this Christmas? And he said, count on it but I talk to him all the time now. But anyway, so he was my bunk mate. We made it through training. I, I decided that I'm in here for three years and I'm gonna make the absolute most of it. I'm not going, I'm not gonna bitch and moan. Like a, a, I know friends who got drafted and they enlisted in the Air Force for four years they, they, to stay out of combat. And then all they did was ruin four years of their life. All they did was hate it, you know, and bitch about it. I said, no, I'm going to excel. And that's what I did. So I, I went through basic training. Um, I was promoted out of basic training, which only, I, I guess, a quarter of us were. Um, I got along very well with the sergeants. Um, some of the guys called me a brown nose. I said, look, I'm going to get along with the sergeants. I'm going to do what they tell me to do. I'm going to be cooperative. And I'm going to show my leadership ability because that's exactly what I plan on doing. As a little aside from basic training, since I knew all of these people in, in, um, in Washington, uh, Congressman George Bush had just been elected in 1966. Two other Texas congressmen, one from the Panhandle, who I'd worked in his 1964 campaign, and then one from uh, Dallas, were all elected that year, and then Senator Tower. And so I'm writing to people in their offices, and I get this congressional mail coming back. And one evening I get, my drill sergeant told me that the captain, the company commander, wanted to see me. So I went in there and saluted and reported, uh, Private McIver saluting, uh, reporting, sir. And he said, uh, McIver, he said, uh, we've noticed that you've been uh, getting a lot of uh, congressional mail here. 
He said, do you have any problems? Is anything bothering you about being here? And I looked at him and I said, why no, sir, they're just my friends. <laughs> so I go through, <coughs> I go through basic training. While I was there, um, because I sco sco scored so high on all of my tests, I was able to, um, I, I was able to enlist with with the provoso um, that I could be do something medically, because having been a pre med student, if I could pass the test. I think those things are, are totally bunk anyway, but I, since I did, I was able to go to uh, advanced uh, individual training, AIT, at, at Fort Sam Houston, Texas. How far do you want me to go as the, the early years? Well, it's up to you. It's up to you. I mean, you know, you can focus this on, on whatever you think is the, the story well, let, that you let, most want to yeah, tell. Let, let, me, let, me, let me finish this story because it's going to tell you how I ended up in Special Forces. Okay, that's great. You know, and then we can go from, that's the second part of my okay. military uh, training. Mm -hmm. um, so I go to Fort Sam Houston, and they had what they call the Leadership Prep, Prep Course, LPC. And what they did is they would uh, they would have people go through this three week course, usually about fifty in the class, um, stay in really really nice um, barracks, which were these old eighteen nineties barracks. You know they called Fort Sam Houston the Country Club of the United States Army. Beautiful place right in the middle of San Antonio. And so I went in to interview with the captain and and the first sergeant. And they were looking at my, at my records and on my medical stuff when I went in the Army, I told them that I had a bad back, I had uh, back spasms, I wore glasses, I had flat feet. Now during, during World War II, you'd probably not get called because of these things, but I, I was very honest about it. I said I've got, I get terrible sinus headaches. And uh, so I was at, talking with the captain, he said, well, you know something, you have all these medical conditions and I don't think that you're, you're right for our leadership. And I looked at him and I said, sir, I remember these conversations. This is almost verbatim. I said, sir, this man's army took me in with all of these defects, whatever they may be. And I said, while I'm here, I should be able to do whatever I can qualify for. I said, I've been a leader. I was a leader in high school. I was a leader in college. I was hired by a United States Senator to go to work for him in Washington, D.C. this year. And I would like to try for this course. He let me in the course. There were 56 guys in our class. I graduated number six. So I'm assigned to a company now to go in the 91A medical training, which is basically a basic medic, a combat medic. And on my uniform, I wore a, uh, uh, what is it, a brassard, uh, the armband mm -hmm. with sergeant stripes on it. I graduated sixth in the class out of 56. And so I led a, I led a platoon. And so I marched him to class, marched him back, take roll, um, and then we had, um, and then during classes I would make sure guys would stay awake. Um, and then we also had traffic patrol in the morning and afternoon, and we'd go stand at these intersections, we would, you know, we were, we were up on these little stands, you know, so th those are some of our duties. So while there, um, I ended up, I ended up being an honor graduate of the course, I think I, I don't know, 98 average or something like that. And uh, I was recommended by my, uh, the leader of my platoon, who was active duty. He was a sergeant first class. Wonderful, wonderful African-American man, just a gentleman and, and all of that, and he really liked me a lot. Like I said, I was a brown nose. Um, and uh, so they had a, You'd go to all these uh, orientations in the in the old uh, World War II movie theater, and someone would stand up on the stage. You got you got uh, films on 
hygiene and dental hygiene and all this kind of stuff, you know, because a lot of guys came out of came out of families and, and areas of this country where things aren't practiced, you know, and especially back in the 60s. So one day they have a uh, special forces orientation. And I'm sitting there in, the, in a staff sergeant in a green beret wearing his uh, fatigues or maybe he was in, in khakis uh, got up on the stage and gave a presentation about the Green Berets. Now, I knew there were Green Berets down there because they did part of their training down there. And every morning and every afternoon when we'd be standing in formation at our company before we'd march to class, there was an ele elevated road right next to our, 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 our barracks. And two classes of Green Beret medics would come marching by with their Green Berets on and I just get the chills. So this uh, staff sergeant gives the um, gives the orientation. He said, "Anyone who's interested, go to the back of the room." So like 50 guys go back there, and, it, and it's just more than our our company. It's a lot of different classes. So I go back there, and the first thing he says, "Anyone who's anyone who's not in for three years and is not willing to enlist for another year, you may leave." Because you you know you can't go through two years and you're not going to you're never going to go to war you know number one and you're not going to finish the training because all the training is that is uh, close to a year long so he said if you have any any uh, misdemeanors or crimes felonies or anything like that more than traffic tickets you may also leave and I can't remember if he asked any more questions but the number starts dwindling. So one day, I go in, he calls eight of us in to take what's called the Special Forces Battery Test. And we're in a little, like a small office building. Uh, and uh, they, there was no air conditioning in there, but they had a big uh, floor fan. They allowed us to take off our fatigue jackets and just sit there with our t-shirts on. We have a test booklet. And not only did the not only did we have the test booklet and the answer sheet, but there was a tape recorder going. And basically, on the tape recorder was the instructions of, of how explaining the situations and how much time you had to do them. And there were questions on there like number one, there was like observation, and it's like okay, there's a picture of this room, and then it shows this item over here, and it said from what position was that taken? So was it taken from there? Was it taken from there? Was, so observation. They would they ask questions about tactical things or even like uh, uh, a, a common everyday occurrence, like a car breaks down or one thing or another. And they say, what? here's 17 di different options. List them in order of the best to the worst. Now the thing is, the tape recorder is going, and you very quickly realize that he's going to be going to the next question. So while he's doing that, you better be reading the answers because you're not going to have enough time to go through all of the options and, and rank them. Mm -hmm. They had personality tests in there, psychology. I love those because I don't know how they work. But I'll tell you what they had. Would you rather be a spy or an English teacher? Well, I try to balance it out because actually I'd rather be an English teacher than a spy. Uh, <laughs> although James Bond was pretty cool. Sean Connery. Um, so anyway, there were eight of us taking the test and when we walked outside while he was grading the papers, we were all standing there. And, uh, several of these guys I'd gone through the leadership prep course with and, and one of them was actually my we had a squad room, the two of us, uh, leading the platoon, so we didn't have to sleep out in the general barracks. And um, so he uh, immediately, we went back in, and he was going to read off the test scores, and he immediately dismissed half of the guys, four of them, said, you didn't, you didn't pass. So he started reading off the, the scores, and um, mine was the last one. And he said, 
MacIver, he said, I've been giving this test down here for six months. He said, I've, think, I've seen thousands of test scores back at Fort Bragg. He said, you've just made the highest grade ever, ever scored on the Special Forces battery test. Now, so I was now qualified for Special Forces. I had to go through a physical test to qualify for airborne because you had to be airborne, a paratrooper, in order to be a Green Beret. So that was going to be the, my next training after, after the medic training. Um, so um, I ended up being uh, recommended as the honor graduate, of course. For some reason, they always picked someone from the National Guard who had already been to meetings, had already had some training and everything else. They did the same thing in basic training. They did it in, in AIT. And I'm like, why do they give these guys the outstanding troop of the whole company when we're the ones who are going to go to war? You know, we're the ones who are going to make careers of this possible. So that always kind of upset me, but at least I got the recommendation. And so uh, when we graduated, um, interestingly, I, I told my, my family that I was, before I went in the Army and, and was going around to all the recruiters, I told my family that I was going to try to be a Green Beret. I'd gotten a copy of this uh, booklet. It was called What It Takes to Be a Green Beret. And then it has a picture of Green Beret like this. About, and inside tells all about, it's like 10 pages long, and it's like, how do you be a Green Beret? And then they have this, this one that, that has vertical pictures, and underneath it, it had a description of what they do. And they, and they, have, they so, show this surgical team under a parachute canopy tent out in the field and they're doing surgery and all of this kind of stuff and I'm just I'm just going like this so um, I've been reading that and uh, that's another reason I, I wanted to go in the Green Berets and my mother said well I don't want you jumping out of airplanes and my brother Rick uh, who was a super athlete and I was not I was more of a book bookworm he said you'll never make it you're not athletic enough and my dad actually pulled me aside. He said, come in the living room. We were sitting in the den. He said, come in the living room. I want to talk to you. He said, I don't think you're cut out for that. Now, my dad was a World War II veteran of the Merchant Marine. He graduated from Merchant Marine Academy out of Kings Point. He was an officer uh, sailing uh, Liberty ships all over, the, all over the Atlantic and the Mediterranean, the North Sea and all of that. But anyway, I was, uh, I was kind of... Uh, surprised he would say that, but I think he really thought that I needed to be an athlete to do it. What I found out when I got in the Green Berets was often the high school quarterbacks were the first ones to flunk out because they didn't have, they thought they could do it on their athleticism and they, they couldn't. The, the uh, test, number one, uh, the number one thing that they looked at first was your GT score, your general technical score. Now, when I took some of those tests, and it would, it would show a, a, a car's distributor or a bolt and, and, and nut, I had very, very little knowledge of that stuff. They were looking for mechanics and stuff like that, so I didn't score well on that, but everything else I did well on. And so I had a GT score, I think, of 128, which is pretty close, they say it's pretty close to your um, IQ. I've done IQ tests on it. Um, but anyway, um, so I, I ended up, from there I ended up going to, um, oh, I never told anyone in my family that I qualified for Special Forces. And they, after I graduated, they said, well, where are you going next? I said, I'm going to Fort Benning, Georgia for jump school. So I go to, I go to Fort Benning, and this is where the athleticism comes in, because we were doing the overhead things and the alligator, well, we'd, we'd actually done all of that in, in, uh, in basic training. But every morning you had to do a run. Everywhere you went, you ran. And we weren't, you know, today they put on uh, PT shorts and t-shirts and, and, and tennis shoes and they run. We ran in our fatigues and our combat boots. And, and then every day we had a, a mile run in the morning. You ran from the barracks 
to the mess hall, from the mess hall to the training area. You ran all around the training area. You're, you're doing all of this stuff for three weeks. And I ended up with shin splints. Um, luckily, Thanksgiving inter, inter, intervened, and I was able to, uh, what I did every night when I went to bed is I would rub down my shins with a bend gay and then wrap them in ace bandages or, or in towels. <clears throat> on the last, uh, on the very last run, my uh, platoon leader was the second lieutenant who had just graduated from West Point. His name was Anderson. I wanted to find him all these years, but so many James Andersons graduated from West Point that same year. Mm. Big class. So um, he was very encouraging, and in fact, the last run we made was four miles. And here I am out there with shin splints trying to run four miles. He literally ran next to me and, and said, stick with it, stick with it, stick with it. And I did, and as soon as I finished the race, not the, the race, it was your jaw. When I finished that, I literally, my legs just gave out and I collapsed on the ground. But I knew that if I didn't get through jump school, I wasn't going to be a Green Beret. So that night I called home. <clears throat> they had pay phones on the, on the wall, outside walls of the barracks, and I called home. Everyone was surprised that I made my five qualifying jumps, that I actually made it through jump school. My brother, the athlete, Rick, I love telling these stories about Rick because we laugh about it now, but we were kind of head, head, head because we're so different. And uh, he said, well, how high were you jumping from? And I said, oh, 1,200 feet. 1,200 feet, wow, wow. So anyway, I'll tell you about, I'll, I'll stop there and, and, and oh, and then, and then I arrived when I graduated. I think they put me on a bus from Fort Benning, Georgia uh, to uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and I arrived at the Special Forces Training Group on a Sunday when nothing was open, none of the offices or anything else was open. I dropped off at the JFK uh, Center for uh, Special Warfare and trying to find a barracks to go to and a place, a bed. And uh, I arrived there on December 1st, 1967. Right. Okay. Um, I hope these aren't too detailed, but not you know, at all. The, the purpose of this is the detail. That's exactly what what we want to get. So, um, okay. So, do you want to jump ahead to Vietnam, or do you want to keep talking about Fort Bragg? How about talking about the, the training regiment at Fort so. Bragg? I think yeah. that that would be good. Um, so, I arrived there on December first, nineteen sixty-seven. Very, very cold winter. A lot of ice storms and things like that. Even like in, in Texas, we'd get ice storms. Uh, like uh, they, in Texas, they say uh, between the North Pole and Amarillo, uh, the only thing, uh, the only thing uh, in between is a barbed wire fence, and someone cut it. We get these terrible, we get blizzards down. But you know something, the weather patterns are, it's much colder in Texas than it was when I was growing up there in the 50s and 60s. But anyway, um, so it was very, very cold winter, and you're going through what they call phase one. You have phase one, which is basically your first phase of tactics and techniques, special forces operations. And then, then you go into your specialty training. And then after that, you go into your second phase of tactics and techniques. So the first first thing is survival techniques, map reading, compass, um, and um, we had a sergeant from Texas. I, I saw him at a reunion about 20 years ago. We ended up sitting to each other on, on next to each other on the bus, and I finally realized who he was. He was the sergeant in charge of us during that face furtered, and he was a real SOB. He was just a badass. And I told him that. I told him that on the bus. I said, we hated you. He said, well, that's, that's why you made it into the Green Berets, because I was. So we got a good laugh out of that. But anyway, so I finished first phase of training. Um, because it was so cold, we weren't able to go on, an, on, on a 
on an exercise for a few days up in the mountains, uh, Uari National Park. Uh, and uh, so I, they actually let us go early for, for our leave for Christmas. I, I hadn't been on leave at all. So I go home for, for two weeks. There was a staff sergeant and his family. Um, he must have been one of the trainers or something like that, but uh, a friend of mine and I were both from Texas. This guy was from Houston. He was taking his family to Houston where he was driving, so he gave us a ride all the way to Houston. Then this friend of mine, he was gonna, we were gonna, we were gonna go to the bus station, Greyhound bus station, and put on our uniforms and then go out to the highway, Interstate 10, and then hitchhike to Columbus and then head north. I would get off in Austin. He would go up to Waco. He lived right outside of Waco. So the guy drops us off at the bus station. And um, we go in, and, and I'm, in the, I'm in the restroom changing in my dress green uniform, my spitshine jump boots blouse, trousers in them, and all that kind of stuff. And um, he had already changed. I, I can't remember why he changed first, but he went out and found out there was a bus heading to Waco. So he leaves me. So I get, I get in a taxi, and I, and I take, have the taxi take me out to Interstate 10. The very, very start of it, I don't think it all had gone to Beaumont by then, east. So the first car by picks me up. I mean, you, you you're out there in a uniform and a green beret, man, they pick you up. It took me four rides. The last one was, my folks lived in a suburb of Austin, so it was kind of, I was in South Austin, and, and I was, they were in Southwest uh, Austin, and it was kind of complicated to get there. The guy was, the last guy to pick me up was in a little Toyota pickup truck, and he was a painter, and he had these big five-gallon paint cans in, in the back of the he said, where are you going? I said, I'm going out to Rollingwood. He said, that's where I'm headed. So he drives me up in front of my house. And I have, I have my duffel bag and I'm in uniform. And my dad and my two brothers are out hanging Christmas lights on the front of the house. So here I am arriving a week early. And um, I, get out of, I get out of the truck. And the first person I looked at was my father. And here is the man who told me that I would, that I wasn't cut out for the Green Berets. He had he had a smile on him that it, it's like his mouth was going to split at the ends because it was so big. And I went over and shook hands with him, and then my brother Rick comes up. I mean, he's this big. He, he's a kid who had six pack stomach when he was four years old. I never had one of those. Uh, and he walks up to me and he says, uh, what are you wearing that green beret for? Cocky, as he was. His name's Rick. <laughs> um, so um, I said, well, I'm a green beret. And he said, no, really, why are you wearing it? I said, I'm a green beret. Well, then my little brother, David, who's now still 12, his birthday was in June. Well, he's just beside himself. Now he has a brother who's a green beret. So I walk into the house and I'm talking to mother and Rick comes in. He says, uh, Mom, is Don really a Green Beret? She said, yes. And I went back into my bedroom, which now Rick had taken over. He had been sharing one with, with David. And I'm uh, putting my duffel bag down and stuff. And Rick comes back there and puts out his hand, shakes my hand. He says, Don, I'm really proud of you for winning the Green Beret. Now, once you had it after phase one, you had to keep it. Uh, another interesting point is uh, my brother took me to school. They hadn't been let out for a Christmas vacation yet. So he took me to, to school for show and tell for his fifth grade class. Years, years later at David's bachelor party, where all of his high school athlete athlete friends were. David was quite an athlete too. Um, at his uh, bachelor party, they, a couple of them came up to me and they said, Ah, oh, Don, we always thought you were a badass, but we know you're not. Uh, but 
those are those are the things that uh, I remember in 1972 going to I was uh, living in Austin actually I was working back in politics for the Republican National Committee and I went in to vote and the woman uh, asked me my name at the table she said what's your name and I said Donald Fraser McIver Jr. and she said are you David's brother and I said yes and she said are you the one who was the Green Beret and I said yes and she said well I was David's fifth grade teacher she said that's all we ever talked about was his brother who was a Green Beret okay. and now his kids did when I go to Dallas or whatever and their friends are there they don't say this is my Uncle Don. They said this is my Uncle Don, and he's a Green Beret. It's that's my that's my title, and it and it's very it's nice. You know they recognize they recognize my service, but also the, the elitism of, of, the, of the special forces. Mm-hmm. Um, so then when I get back to Fort Bragg, I'm assigned to um, the medic class. So I don't get to I don't get to start immediately. I have to sit out two weeks or three weeks until the next class starts. So during that, they put me on guard duty, and you're walking around PXs, post exchanges, and they'll put you out at a ammo dump, and you walk around and you don't have any bullets in your weapon, stuff like that. And I had uh, I had uh, one day for guard duty. I think it was my first day for guard duty, and I put on a starched, uh, they were cotton, uh, fatigue, fresh, freshly started. We call it breaking starch because they, were, they had so much starch in them, when you put your leg through it, they went, <laughs> which was kind of cool, and then you'd blouse them into your trousers and all that kind of stuff. Put on my pistol belt, and I had my uh, rolled up a poncho tucked in on the back in a canteen, and... and um, and then I go into the first sergeant. His name was Mayerly, M-E-H-R-E, M-A-R-E-R-H-Y or something. Wonderful guy. And you had to know your general orders. You needed to know the code of conduct. Now this is what they teach you in basic training, but you needed to, you needed to know this stuff. And then, and then current events. This was the week that, uh, a week or two earlier, the Pueblo, the USS Pueblo, had been seized um, by North Korea. And um, in the Pacific, he asked me the captain's name, Blucher, or Booker, Booker. Um, He asked me how many men were on board the ship, 58. He asked me the uh, leader of, uh, South Vietnam, DM. Uh, he asked me all, the, all these different current event questions, and the only one I could not answer was the name of the leader uh, of, uh, of Cambodia, who was Prince Chinook. So he just smiled. He said, you're ready to go. So I go, and I'm carrying an M14 rifle at that time. I qualified for that in uh, basic training. And so I had... not I hadn't done the M16 yet. Later, I would. Uh, later, they would give me an M16 when I was on guard duty, but I, I was still using the M14. So I go over there, and, and of course, you're holding your rifle, and then, and then you have to flip your rifle and pull open the chamber, and he, you know, he's looking at all of that, and he's inspecting you, and he's asking you all these questions, and he goes around the back, and he's looking at how everything is put together. And when I put on my fatigues that day, we had flap rear pockets, and they had a button on them. Well, I was missing a button on that flap, on one of the flaps, and I didn't have, I didn't have another clean uniform to put on. So I was just praying that the guy wouldn't see that. So he comes back around, and there's probably a dozen, 20 guys out there who are going to be put on guard duty that day, maybe more than that, maybe a full platoon. He called me up and he said, Don, he said, uh, MacIver, he said, you're, you're general's orderly for today. Which basically meant that you were the top troop out there that day. The best with answering the questions and, and the way you were dressed and everything else. And so basically what that meant was that you get, get, got to go over to the JFK Center and, and spend, spend a day with the general. 
usually what you did is you actually went in there and he congratulated you and then you went back to the barracks and did whatever you wanted to do that day. Mm. So, again, I wasn't brown nosing, but I was just good, you know? And that's what I, that's, I wanted to excel. So then I go into Special Forces and medic training. In the first phase, the first phase was, uh, was basically um, almost a duplicate of what I'd just gone through at Fort, Fort Sam Houston for basic combat medic training. So I was an honor graduate out of that. And then the next phase, we, had our, we started with a class of 117. Well, it started to quickly dwindle. Uh, some guys would get in trouble, they'd go out and, and, and get a DUI or a traffic ticket or they thought they were the great athlete and they couldn't do the, they couldn't handle the, work, the study load and stuff like that. Or, and uh, so the second phase, after I graduated from that, they flew us down to San Antonio back to Fort Sam Houston. And we went into a phase of training that was more, more involved. Uh, we studied pharmacy. We studied a lot of nursing techniques uh, that they that they hadn't taught in in the first phase. Um, we went in and, and uh, worked on cadavers, um, and uh, we did lab work. We learned about all of the. We did all of our lab work. I mean, we were they were training us to be the th closest thing to doctors in the army. And the nurses didn't like us because we were getting such good training and they were kind of jealous of us until they saw what we could actually do. And then they were like appreciative, some of them. So anyway, I go through that. Uh, we were even studying like the um, uh, NATO book on uh, emergency war surgery. And I had a Merck manual. I had a uh, PDR which is the big book on all the drugs. Um, we, had, we had a manual, the Special Forces um, medic, Medical Specialist book that they wrote that year. Um, and so we're, we're doing everything from emergency, emergency uh, combat training uh, of uh, someone with a wound in the thigh, shot in the thigh, or something like that, and you, they, you run over and you start doing the work and then you write a report on it. I still have one of the reports that I wrote in 1968. And my team partner on that, named uh, Kenneth Kaler, K-O-E-H-L-E-R, uh, we both ended up in Vietnam at the same time. And I'd gone on a mission up north and we had a we had a couple days stand down, and the camp was right on the beach on the south. It was at uh, what was the show China Beach? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was right. It was right there, right next to it. And uh, I was sitting on the uh, on the beach uh, down by the surf one day, and Ken uh, came uh, running by. He did. He jogged every morning, so we talked. We hadn't seen each other since we left Fort Bragg. And months later, I heard that he had been killed. And I wrote his father a really nice letter and got a nice reply on it. But anyway, um, so we finished, we finished that training. And the last week, we have final exams. I mean, this is like college. And you're in there and you're telling, out of the, out of the uh, uh, emergency war surgery NATO book, we learned about how, what happens when a bullet hits a person. The velocity, the mass, all of it, you know, it's like Einstein. All of, all of the mechanics and physics that go into all, all of that kind of stuff. So you're writing all this stuff in your, in your test, textbook. You're, you're doing pharmacy, everything from aspirin to much antibiotics and everything else. Um, and so we, had, we were down to half of our class. We were down to 56 people. Now, some of the people had gotten recycled. They realized that maybe they flunked the test or something like that in, in the first phase. And so they, they held them back to go through the start the course over again. But we were down to 56 people. And um, so based on, your, based on your standing in the class, 
you could choose what Army hospital you wanted to go to for your on-the-job training. And a lot, and, and there, there were only a limited, a limited number of hospitals that they allowed you to go to, but there were a couple of them that you really wanted to because they would allow you to do, they go into surgery and deliver babies and things like that, which I actually got to do. And um, so in that class, we finished our exams. And that night, uh, guys were throwing mattresses out of the window. Uh, we had uh, single beds, and we were going down and getting alcohol. And I remember I had a pint of uh, Cuddy Sark scotch. I wasn't much of a drinker. Um, and uh, some of the some of the wax came over from the wax barracks who were in medical training of one sort or another, and we sat around and and uh, talked and drank and I somehow listened to music, radios or whatever. And the next day they tell us how we ranked in the class. I graduated number six. Again, I, number six seems to be my, my number. And so um, I was promoted again. I was promoted to uh, E4. I've been, every, every school I went to I was promoted. Promoted out of basic, I was promoted out of uh, uh, basic combat medic training. Then I was promoted right in the middle of the, of the uh, special force medic class. I was a brown guy, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so I get promoted, and uh, out of the top ten in the class, nine of us chose to go, go to Fort Dix, New Jersey, because again they would allow you to go into surgery and and deliver babies and work in the emergency room and all of that kind of stuff. The only person who didn't go, he wanted to be close to his family, I think, in Kentucky, so he went to Fort Campbell. Um, so we head out to, um, they had a nice graduation ceremony for us. We head up to Fort Dix, get on an airplane. Well, that was kind of interesting, a little side story. Mm -hmm. I'm talking too much. This is my book. <laughs> um, since I've been so involved in politics and I stayed up with it, and, and even um, during the election cycle of 1968, I would go in um, into the day room and, and watch uh, politics. And I'd watch the news every night. And then even like for election night, um, a couple of the guys we, we got off from, uh, we were allowed to go into, into Fayetteville, North Carolina. They called it Fayetteville. And um, so uh, we got a motel room, and we sat up and watched the election returns come in. And that was the uh, Nixon-Humphrey race. And uh, oh, so here we are, where we were boarding the airport airplane at, at uh, San Antonio Air, Air, Airport. It was sort of a a one-story room, and, and then you'd walk out and climb the stairs. This was, I guess, some airports had the had the boom things uh, where you walk down the hallway or whatever. But we were we were sitting there waiting for the flight, and uh, a black limousine pulls up, black Cadillac limousine. All the guys are like, they called my nickname was Senator. I was known as Senator McIver because I was always, always talking politics. So the limousine pulls up and they said, um, hey, McIver, who's, who, who's that? I said, well, Rockefeller's in town today. Nelson, Nelson Rockefeller, governor of New York, was, uh, of course, he was uh, trying to get the nomination that year also. And uh, so this was, let me think, when did we graduate? This was in the summer, and uh, so it was before the before the sixty before the convention, all that. So, um, out of the car are like four or five women, and I go back. Um, oh, so we're sitting there, 
And for some reason, we, we all had our, our helmets. And it was set up for with the straps and everything else for paratroopers, you know, so your helmet wouldn't fly off when you jumped out of an airplane. I don't know why we were ca all carrying them. But uh, anyway, um, out of the car get these four or five women. And I immediately recognized Ann Arm Armstrong, who ended up being the am ambassador to Great Britain in the Nixon administration, Ford administration. And uh, she'd been the vice chairman of the Republican Party of Texas and probably still was at that time. So I knew her quite well. And um, also with her was Pat Nixon. So they come walking in right, right by us. You know, I walked over. I walked over to Ann Armstrong and say hi to her, and she's just chit chatting. And the other women were all staff members at the Republican Party of Texas, who I knew. And they had, they had already walked ahead while I was. And they sort of turned back, and I said, "Would it be possible for me to meet Mrs. Nixon?" And she said, "Sure." So she introduced me to Pat Nixon. Then we get on the airplane, and we're all we have all our, our paratrooper helmets, and we all put them on. Buckle up. Nope. The stewardesses finally came by and said, will you please take those off because you're, the, the passengers are disturbed by that. <laughs> um, just one of those little things that, that Special Forces did. Uh, our graduating class, every graduating class out of, out of Fort Sam Houston had to do something special and every morning they uh, they fired cannons out on the big parade ground, and the cannons faced the, uh, the uh, commanding general's house. Again, one of those really nice old houses from the 1890s or early 1900s. Well, during the night, the Special Forces went out there and, and, and uh, filled up one of the cannons with golf balls. And so it ended up shooting at the... Uh, another class left a, an alligator from the... Uh, um, San Antonio Zoo sitting on the general's front porch. They had the big verandas out front. Um, our class, a couple of the guys one night went to the water tower and it had a big fence around it and they dug underneath the fence with entrenching tools that you dig foxholes with and they went up, climbed up the tower and hung a huge sheet up there that said SF rules, Special Forces rules. Um, when we graduated, we the uh, we always had problems with the with the MPs, military police, because they they were they were usually the big big men on campus. They aren't when the Green Berets are there, and I guess we're a little bit cocky too. After all, we're Green Berets. <laughs> So one night, a couple of the guys go over to the uh, MP uh, station, and they have these signs on a pole and then a, a cross, and then it hangs. So it's sort of like in a real estate firm or something like that. And so it's hanging by these two metal clips. And they went over there with, with uh, bolt cutters and, and cut that off, brought, it back to, brought the sign back to the barracks, and all of us signed it with a magic marker and gave it to the E6, who was the one who gave me the test. He was our liaison. And um, the MPs never found that sign. <laughs> and, our, and we had a first sergeant. He was sort of a baby Huey-shaped guy, redhead, a little bit overweight, tall but just the nicest, gentlest guy you could imagine, and he, he defended us to the max. Um, there's too many stories in there, but anyway. So um, we get back to Fort Bragg. Oh, we go to OJT. And what we did on, on OJT was we were assigned to a, 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 now we're in a brick building, just like the brick barracks like they built down special forces were the first ones to get that those down at Fort, Fort Bragg so you're now in an eight, a eight man room and um, I was actually in a squad room with another guy who was training as a pharmacist uh, mate or something like that x-ray tech or something and we didn't get along because I was never there and he always he was always upset because I wouldn't help clean the room well I made but my uh, 
the reason was is we wore whites. Uh, we had the white cotton pants bloused into our boots. We had those nice white jackets that, with the high collar and it buttons down the side, really cool. And then it has had the maroon caduceus on it. And then we had our airborne jump wings over the background, which is the colors of the green beret, the same ones on my beret there, the teal and, and gold. And so in the morning, we were able to eat in the mess hall of the hospital. And it was in the basement. You'd go in there and they'd fix your eggs any way you wanted them. And then on Friday night, they had shrimp cocktail. So we'd go in there in the morning and eat breakfast, and then we'd be assigned, you'd, you'd either be assigned for a week or two weeks. You could be assigned to the emergency room, uh, uh, obstetrics, pediatrics, uh, surgery, minor surgery, something else in there. Uh, because we were there, I think, for eight weeks, eight or nine weeks. So we'd go to our we'd go to our training during the day. Then we would go down to the mess hall right afterwards, and we'd eat dinner. And then we'd be right up. We we would spend our evenings in the in the in the emergency room. We'd be in there until midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock. And so we were never in bed. You know, we were we wanted to learn, and the doctors there would teach you. And the first, the very first thing, the first time, I think I was assigned to the emergency room, I think that was my first um, duty station. They bring in an old man who had just had a heart attack. And so I'm there with the response team, and they, and they put an endotracheal tube down into his trachea. And then they attach an ambu bag, which is, you've probably seen those on some of the TV shows, or mm. you're squeezing. The doctor said, you do that. So I'm... The guy ended up dying, but you know this is this is the responsibility they gave us. One of the very first nights we were we were in the emergency room, and it wasn't that ten of us were there at the emergency room every night. Some of the guys would want nights off or uh, weren't really interested in, in doing that. And um, uh, I had a guy come in, and he had a he'd been cut somehow above his eye eyelid. So I was the first one to give stitches. And of course, we've been taught that at, at Fort Bragg, or Fort uh, Sam Houston. And um, so I put it, luckily, I, I put an eye sheet over it. You know, one of those, like the scrubs, the color of the scrubs, that bluish green mm -hmm. color. And it, and it just had a big hole in it, right in the middle. And so you place that over his face and you're, you're uh, eyeing just the, where you're going to be uh, doing the surgery. And, and it's a good thing because my hands were literally shaking. This was the first time I put in a live stitch. And so I, I insert, I take a syringe and I put some lidocaine in there and then I sew them up. And I put a lot of stitches in it too. We were very fortunate because in the, in the uh, uh, minor surgical clinic where we spent two weeks, we had plastic surgeons who were in the reserves, and they were on their two-week summer duty. And they taught us how to sew up stuff and not leave scars. And I practiced that in Vietnam. Um, so um, that's what we did. And uh, I went in one night, I was working in the emergency room, and a woman came in in very, very heavy labor. She was in contractions. And the guy said, why don't, you, why don't you go up there and see if you can get in there for the delivery? So I go up there and I, and I knock on the, on the door and a nurse comes. We were very direct. <laughs> no pussyfooting around for us. We, we, we just let him know what we wanted to do. And I said, and the doctor came to the door. He said, well, have you seen the film on, on deliveries? And I said, yes, well, I had. But I go in there and I'm standing right next to him and he lets me. The baby delivers itself. But, you know. And then uh, the woman needed, she had an episiotomy. And he wanted me to sew it up. But apparently when we were working with the baby, he was doing the, uh, what do they call it? 
it's basically the how healthy the baby is and it basically initials the color and the breathing and all of that kind of stuff and I touched a piece of equipment I was in surgical gloves and I touched a piece of equipment and so he said you know something you just contaminated your glove so anyway he went ahead and did the sewed up the episiotomy but that was an experience um, and uh, so we graduated from that and then headed back to uh, Fort Bragg and then we entered our final phase of training which was very very heavy medical tropical medicine and surgery our medical part uh, we studied all of the tropical diseases all the parasites roundworms hookworms tapeworms uh, schistosomiasis, uh, typhoid, uh, typhus, uh, malaria, especially malaria, um, and all of, the, all of this stuff. We had, we had all these guys giving lectures. It was like down at Fort Bragg, uh, at Fort Sam Houston. We were uh, trained pharmacists. Were all, all of the people training us were mainly officers. A lot of them were doctors, uh, pharmacists, uh, lab leaders and all that kind of stuff. So we're getting, we're getting the top dogs for the training. They estimated that it cost, in 1967, they estimated that it cost $133,000 to train a special forces medic. Now, if you can imagine that in, in today's dollars, I mean, when I came home from Vietnam, I bought a 1970 Firebird for $3,200. Uh, so you can imagine the, the inflation, it's probably a million dollars now to, I think I actually heard that figure, it's about a million dollars to train a special force medic today. Um, so we go back to Fort Bragg and we're, and we're taking this training. And one thing was very interesting because um, we were learning the lab work and, and all of this kind of stuff and, and, and what the, when you looked in a microscope what the every bug looked like, you know, what, how do you tell it's a tapeworm, how do you tell it's a hookworm, how do you tell it's, it's an infected cell with malaria, or whatever, spirochetes, all of that kind of stuff. So, I took a test, I was doing really well, and I took a test, and it was on malaria, and you had to tell the life cycle of the, of, of the uh, malarial bug, and when you get the chills, when you, when you get the fevers, and what, what the, what's going on in the body. I missed a step and I got totally out of, I was like, wait a second, I missed something here. Well, I ended up making a 76 on the test. That was part of the test. And I got called in to the uh, major, his name was uh, Barry Zindler, Major Barry Zindler. See, I even remember these guys' names. And. Um, he sat me down and he said, uh, McIver, he said, we're going to terminate you. I mean, here I, here I, I, I was shocked. I mean, you know, a 76 is actually a, a C or a C plus. I'd never made a 76 on any test down there. I mean, everything was a 90 to 100. And I told him, I said, well, Major, I said, you know something, I, I explained what happened on, with that thing. And, uh, and I told him, I said, I was an honor graduate out of, out of Fort Sam Houston. He said, you were? Oh, and he also told me, he says, by the way, um, you're not really qualified for Special Forces anymore because uh, your, your eye, uh, your vision isn't up to, up to snuff for qualification for Special Forces anymore. And he already told me he was going to keep me. He said, well, he, after I told him I'd been an R graduate, and we, we discussed uh, me improving. And then he brought up this vision. I said, I, I said, well, I, you're, you're not going to let me go, are you? And I just smiled, and he said, no. So then I did fine in that. And at the same time, we started. This is, this is kind of weird, because people don't talk about this. And we, had to, we had a secret security clearance. When I got to Vietnam, I was in special operations, so I had to have a top secret. And, and they did, they sent the FBI out. So this was, this wasn't, oh, we're just going to give you a top secret clearance. They, they went and interviewed people. 
my friends wouldn't tell me what, what they asked because they were told you can't do that, including one of John Tower's top, top aides. Um, so we go into what's called dog lab. They used to operate on goats, and they still do on goats. But at that time, they, they, they were using dogs that were at the pound that they were going to euthanize. What they did is they do brought them to dog lab. They put them in kennels. We were each assigned a dog or we got to pick a dog. And that was going to be our patient. Now, everything... Oh, excuse me. Scary. I mean, it just I, I jumped. Um, and I could see him. He probably reacted differently. We're almost done. It's 517. And they're not in here yet. So I was assigned a dog. And the first thing that you did, you gave him an exam, physical exam, checked him for heartworms and everything else. We were also taught vet veterinarianism. <laughs> Veterinary, veterinary medicine, I should say. That almost sounded like a religion. Vet, 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 <laughs> anyway, I can't even say it again. Um, what they would do is they would take, they had a ballistic chamber, which was just a long tube, concrete walls and everything else. They'd take the dog out of there, and first we'd bring it into surgery, we'd do what was called a cut down. Basically what that is, You'd make a, a decision incision into the leg, and then you would bring the the vein up outside of the skin. You would tie it down, and then you'd insert the needle there. Okay, I don't know if they still do those in surgery today or not, uh, but uh, that was that was a sure way to make sure that you you were giving the transfusions or whatever they needed. And then, uh, and they're under uh, anesthesia. We put them down under uh, what's the gas? The uh, not chloroform. Not nitrous oxide or something. No, no, like not even that fancy. Uh, I'll think of it. I'm having a senior moment at the same time. Uh, but anyway, we put them down. You had an anesthesiologist, you had a surgeon, you had an uh, assistant surgeon, you had a, uh, you had a instrument tech who would hand you scalpel, please, mosquito uh, forceps, please, whatever you needed. You had an inside circulator who was providing any hooking up more IVs or whatever, and then you had an outside circulator who would go out if you needed a new IV or you needed some drug or something like that. So it was. And you were scrubbed down and everything. I mean, it was a real, it was a surgical suite. So anyway, I did my cut down. What they do is, is, is they would shoot low velocity around into the thigh. And then you'd bring him back in there. You'd already done the cut down. And then you would debris the wound. In other words, you cut out all the dead tissue. And then you'd wrap the wound. And then you'd care for that, that dog for as many days as you needed to you do a secondary closure. In other words, you didn't sew it up. You, you, it, it was better to leave those wounds open because they're a deeper wound. And then sew it up later, you know. And then later what they would do is you, they'd bring you back in there and you'd do an amputation. All under, all under anesthesia. And then, you, then they would put the dog down. Now it sounds horrible. But I'll tell you what, um, people complain about scientific research using animals. These dogs were about to be, be gassed. And I'll tell you what, we loved those dogs and we took care of them. So what happened is I just flunked, I, I was taking both the medical course and the surgical course at the same time. I had a really nice dog too. He was a big uh, pointer or something like that. So. When I flunked that test, they recycled me. I had to go back with the next class that came in and start that phase over and, I, and start dog lab over. So I didn't get kicked out. 
I don't like to tell that story because it's the, the only time that I got in trouble. But I thought, you know something, you make a 76 on a test and you've been making 90s and 98s on them and, and they want to kick you out after what I've gone through and I've been promoted every time. And so, um, so then I was assigned another dog and it was a, scr a scrawny little thing. And we go into, we go into surgery now I have a new surgical team too because I'm not with my original class, which is, but the next class, we all entered, there were only two classes at a time, so you saw the guys around and they would they would ship you out to the to the schools at the same time anyway because people were in different phases, so we got to know those guys too. So here I am, I just done the cut down. We're getting ready to take it. No, I think we'd done the cut down. Yeah, we'd done the cut down, and we he had gone through the ballistic chamber. So now I'm starting to debreed the wound. My anesthesiologist says um, I'm not getting a heartbeat. Then he says he's not breathing. I look at my assistant surgeon. I said, "Get the vet." He was a captain. His name was Cheatham or Chatham, Cheatham. He comes in, he moves my assistant surgeon out of the place. He said, give me a scalpel. The instrument tech hands him a scalpel. He slices into the chest and gives the dog a heart massage. And the dog comes back to life. He tosses, he tosses the, the scalpel on the tray right in front of me. He says, so I'm up. This is, as far as I know, it's the only dog, dog who ever died on the operating table when we brought him back. We, which is kind of weird because I brought someone back to life in Vietnam. Um, so, the they air conditioned that building and we had the stainless steel operating tables and all of that kind of stuff. It was freezing cold in there. And so I... They said, stay in here, don't bring the dog out to the kennels. Stay here and take care of it. So I was sleeping on the surgical table, freezing, and throwing a sheet over me and shaking. I'm still in my fatigues. We, I had the dog over in some type of cushion bed or something like that, and I kept going over and checking its pulse and all of that kind of stuff, his breathing. But all my, all my friends, before we left that afternoon, it was about 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. He said, just let it go, and they'll give you another dog to walk. I'm like, no, no. Would I do that with the guy in mm -hmm. Vietnam? Mm -hmm. So I kept that dog alive for 17 days. I was in the kennel all the time, changing its bandages. I was giving it streptomycin for, uh, for infection. The streptomycin uh, probably made him go deaf, which is uh, something that happens in, in people. But I was giving him, I was giving him pretty high doses. And one day, the um, while I'm out there taking care of the dog, the uh, vet comes by and uh, says, um, Where's that, where's, that, where's that dog we did the open heart surgery on? I said, right here, uh, Captain. Well, he was there with the commanding general of the John F. Kennedy Center for Special Warfare, the only general in Special Forces, a one-star. This before they went to, to the regimental thing in the Special Operations Command, where now you have four stars in there and all that. So he's telling the story about all of this stuff. He sees off the general, and he comes back out there, and he says, MacIver, he said, you, you've done an outstanding job. He said, go ahead and put it down. So I didn't go back and do an amputation or anything like that. And we put, we gently put the dog down. Um, that became, a, that's part of Special Forces lore, actually. In 2002, I went to Fort Bragg for their um, 50th anniversary celebration. It's funny because I, I started thinking, I went in 1967, and Special Forces was founded in 1952 out of the groups from 
World War II, the OSS, the uh, First Special Service Force, which was Canadian and American troops, the Devil's Brigade is what they called them, and Ranger battalions from uh, 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 Normandy and, and also and then Korea. I was trained by all these guys who had those patches on the, on their combat shoulder. You have them on. The, you have your special forces unit patch here, but if you were in combat, you have. So I've got guys with the with the with the red uh, arrowhead, Canada, USA, on my, and the range battalions. On, I mean, these are heroes. So. Um, so I'm at, we have a big barbecue, and I, and I had met, I hadn't seen him in years, I hadn't seen him since 1968, his name was uh, Sergeant Stubbs, Jim Stubbs, very big, husky, muscular uh, African American, he was a sergeant first class at that time, and just the nicest guy in the world. I used to see him in church every Sunday at the Memorial Chapel. And uh, he had lost his wife. She had died of cancer and he, he remarried and he had a little son from his first marriage. But anyway, I walk up to this group of people and uh, uh, Sergeant Stubbs says, uh, this is MacIver. And the woman who was the wife of the man who ran Dog Lab and is the one who shot the dogs, she said, oh, are you the one who did the open heart surgery? 1968, that's uh, 32 years, 33, 34 years. And that story was still there in MacIver. Now I get a lot of, I get a lot of, you know, am I the TV character, you know? That's, that's another story, but it's kind of funny too. Uh, I'm the original. Yeah. That's what I tell people. So, so anyway, now I'm now we graduate from dog lab and we go in for orals, just like medical school, law school. We got these captains, we got doctors, we got senior sergeants who had trained us, and we sit there. I don't know for an hour or two hours, go through orals, and they're asking all kinds of questions. You don't have a book, you don't have your notes, you don't have anything. Well, I graduated. I was now a, a Green Beret medic, 91, 91B, which was the designation at that time. It's now 18 Delta. Um, so I was a 91 Bravo, and um, I was now going to get assigned to a Special Forces group um, and go home for Christmas. So from the time I went in the Army, June 12, 1967, until the middle of December when I graduated from Special Forces Medic Training, I'd been for 18 months. That was my initial training. And I only had, I had a two week vacation, uh, leave, then I had the two weeks when I was on guard duty between classes, and then I, then I, uh, I had the last two weeks of uh, 1968 before I came back. Um, and, um, at, at this at this barbecue, Sergeant Sergeant uh, Stubbs told me, he said, Don, after and and here here's something that thirty some odd years later he's telling you that you didn't know at the time. He said, Don, after you kept that dog alive and, and you didn't let it die, he said there was no way we we're going to let you flunk that course. He said you were going to pass it. And we gave him our, our we, we pitched in and we went down to the uh, PX and we bought him a really nice folding buck knife with a walnut and, and, and brass ends on it, you know. And we gave that to him as a present. He went and had all of our names engraved on it. Now interesting, the, the, the assistant surgeon, who I also saw at the Medal of Honor ceremony that I went to last week, you're familiar with that, right? Mm -hmm. I think I emailed, I, I sent out an email that I, that I described what I was doing. Okay, I Okay. I don't have the Well, mistake. anyway, I went to a, these new Medal of Honor recipients. I went to a reception. There are three of them are still alive. 28 of them were awarded the Medal of Honor, mm -hmm. if you're familiar with that. Because they they were passed over with the Medal of Honor because of their ethnicity, their race, or their religion. So they had, they had culled through 
thousands of records of guys who had probably won the Distinguished Service Cross, which is the second down, mm -hmm. and usually it says that you're not quite there for the Medal of Honor, but they knew that there were a lot of men from the Korean and the Korean War and, and, and uh, Vietnam War who were passed over for the Medal of Honor because, because they were Jewish, or they were Hispanic, or they were black. And so they awarded, uh, he awarded 24 Medals of Honor at the White House last week, last Tuesday, a week ago, and, uh, and the Special Forces uh, Charity Trust had a reception at the Sheridan Hotel at, at Pentagon City. There were only three of them who were still alive out of the guys who were presented the Medal of Honor, and two of them were Green Berets. Both of them were from Texas, where I'm from. Both of them born in Corpus Christi, one Hispanic and one, and one black. And I knew one of them because he had been our, our leader when we went in and did an operation, a simulated uh, counterinsurgency operation down in Panama in 1973. So I brought him a letter from our team, and I brought him a team picture that was taken that year before we went down there, black and white. We're all dressed in camouflage and different hats and scarves and all this kind of stuff. And I told him, when I saw him at the ceremony, I said, well, I said, we all thought we were a bunch of badasses, but we really weren't. And he just laughed at them, but he remembered us. And I said, and in, and in the letter I gave him, I said, we remembered you. 41 years, 41 years later, we're still talking about you. And he's in frail health and all that kind of stuff. So it was, it was him and the other Medal of Honor recipient who I also met, a beautiful cocktail party past hors d'oeuvres and a nice bar, open bar and all that kind of stuff, some speeches. And there were two Medal of Honor recipients there. Number one was Roger Donlin, who was on the Saturday Evening Post. And I've met him many times. I have his book signed. And then Gary Bykirk, <coughs> who was one of the last uh, Vietnam veterans uh, presented in 1972 by Richard Nixon. Um, he came home and went back to Rochester, New York, was so affected by the war that he went and lived in a cave. He had long hair and a long beard and all this kind of stuff. He's in a cave. And uh, one day a man in a suit comes up to the cave and says, are you Gary Bikirk? And he said, yes. And he said, well, the President of the United States requests your presence at the White House wants to present you with the Medal of Honor. So Gary's there. Now Gary was the assistant surgeon who the vet moved out of the way so he could do the open chest heart massage. I've seen Gary twice since we left for Vietnam and one was at that 2002 50th anniversary of Special Forces and then, and then the other night we sat there for half an hour. He's such a nice guy, and it, I, I feel like I feel like we're brothers. I mean, it's and he, um, it, you you can't imagine the esprit de corps and the and the friendship, and uh, it's like you you have a platonic relationship with these people, and to be able to sit there, and I haven't seen him what since 2002. That's 12 years ago. And I saw him at the big barbecue we had, and he was wearing a polo shirt, a short sleeve golf shirt, white, and Levi's. And I walked up to him and I said, Gary Bikirk? And he said, yes. I said, well, I'm Don McIver. Well, immediately we hugged each other. And I mean, we hadn't seen each other in 33 years. But we knew each other. Mm -hmm. He asked me later, we hung out, we hung out that whole week for the convention. We were there for, I think, four days. And we went up and spoke to Roger Donlin. And we, you know, I told him that we were classmates and stuff like that. And um, he had asked me later after the bargain, he said, well, how, how did you know it was me? I said, well, number one, I said, you look like Gary Bikirk. And I said, number two, you had a metal bong around your neck. He was even wearing it with, they do that. You know, and it's appropriate. It's not showing off. It's like, you know, like in, uh, they sign their name and they're, they're allowed to put Gary Biker, M-O-H. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, uh, the Victoria Cross. If you're, or if you're a knight, in, you know, like 
uh, Sir uh, Sean Connery, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, you put, you can put that something of the British Empire, whatever it is, you know. Right. Uh, so you can put M O H after your after your name. Mm -hmm. Now I've got a Bronze Star, but I don't, I don't put that down. <laughs> mm -hmm. I wear, I wear this. What is, what is that? It's the Bronze Star. It's the it's the fourth highest decoration for valor, but it's also given. Mine was. They didn't hand out a lot of medals at my unit. We were doing cross border operations into Cambodia, and they were too busy to write up people for medals. A lot of guys got them, but they prob probably weren't getting the level that they would give them in an infantry unit or whatever. We were, it was our daily job, and it was really tough work. Um, so at the very end of my tour, the master sergeant head of our dispensary, 20 bed dispensary, uh, field hospital, uh, camp hospital, um, asked me what I had received. And I said, well, I got an air medal. Well, I qualified for about 10 of them, but only put in for two and the, they messed up the paperwork and gave me one. I'm still owed an air medal. Uh, but, uh, he said, I'm going to put you in for the Bronze Star for all of the flying you've done and then also the ground operations. So I got, I got a Brown Star for meritorious achievement in ground operations against a, a, a foreign enemy force. And I have this certificate on my wall. It's, we call it the Glory Wall. It's all of your certificates, your medals, and its pictures. And I have a Glory Wall, and I'm not ashamed of it. It's in my bedroom, so... <laughs> It's not sitting out in the living room or in the front hallway or sort of hidden. But some people, when people could, when people come over and we're, they're, they're with friends of mine who, who know about my background, they say, "Hey, come in here. I want to show you something." Mm. People are usually impressed. Um, so anyway, I wear this. I, I, I actually, I actually, it, it was almost a political statement, but um, I started wearing this years ago. And I was very upset I, when I worked for the Republican National Committee in 1972. I went to Washington, and there was a guy wearing a, a Bronze Star lapel pin. He worked for the Republican National Committee also. I said, "Well, you know something? I said mine was not for valor. You have a V device on the on the on the actual metal, on the ribbon. It's a little bronze brass V that you pin in." And I've never claimed mine was for valor. Um, and uh, I said, you know, I've never, I, I came back from Vietnam two years ago, but I've never worn a lapel pin because my, my, my Bronze Star wasn't for valor. Mine was for meritorious achievement. He said, well, what all did you get? And I said, well, I got, a, I got the combat medic badge, which means I treated people under, under fire. Uh, I got the Bronze Star and I got the Air Medal. He said, oh, we gave those to everyone. I leaned into him and I said, well, I know what I did for mine. And, that, and, I've, and I've actually heard other people. I've met other people who are in their lapel pin. And say, yeah, that's just one of those little things they gave us. And I'm like, and, I, and during the Iraq War, um, when we went into Afghanistan, we're sent in the Air Force and Special Forces. And I actually saw him at a breakfast, uh, Veterans Day 2001. We had a big uh, Veterans Day breakfast at the uh, Park, Park Avenue Armory. And everyone spoke. The mayor spoke, uh, Giuliani was leaving office, Bloomberg was coming in, the Cardinal spoke, everyone, everyone spoke. And then uh, Bush got up and I was sitting at tables right second row out and they had big curtains behind the stage and then the rope, velvet rope and, and brass stanchions around. This is sort of off the subject, but I'll tell it anyway. So we're sitting at the second table back and having known the Bush family for many years, I, I'm the same age as George W. and we got to know each other during his father's campaign. We were both 23 years old. He was in the Texas National Guard. I'd just come back from Vietnam. A week out of Vietnam, I started working for him. But anyway, uh, when he was done, my friend, my best friend and my business partner in the World Trade Center asked me if I was going to go up and try to say hi to him. 
and he had gotten off the stage and he walked to the left and it looked like he was leaving. Well, he went down to the end of the stanchions and started coming back and signing programs and shaking hands. So I sort of wiggled my way up and I was standing next to one of our, our Vietnam veterans uh, chapter members and, and his wife and I was sort of right behind and in between them. And he was shaking hands with them and he looked up at me, I put my hand out and I said, Don McIver. And I was wearing a black uh, camel hair blazer and gray slacks. And since we were doing the parade that day and everything else, I had all of my miniature medals like he had put on a tuxedo. And he, he, when I said, hi, Don McIver, he said, Don. And then he looked at my, at my medals and he, and he, and he tapped them with, with the back of his hand like this. He said, I forgot you had all of that. And then he's he's, he's sort of, this is a 30 second conversation. He starts moving down, he's signing programs and shaking hands. And I, and I, I, I I asked him, I said, how are your folks? And he said, they're fine, how are you? And I said, well, I lost my office in World Trade Center. He said, that was a great tragedy. And I said, Mr. President, you're doing the right thing in Afghanistan. You sent in special forces in the Air Force. And it's the special forces who knocked down the Taliban. If you've read the book, The Horse Soldiers, and they're putting a, they did a sculpture of it that's going on the very south end of the World Trade Center site. Those are Green Berets. Um, but anyway, um, um, there's a lot of history in between what I did in Vietnam and when I came back and went in the reserves and all of that kind of stuff. But that, when we graduated, when we graduated from uh, Special Force, oh, then we went into our last phase of, of tactics and techniques. And they put you out in Uari National Forest. Here we are in the middle of December. It's freezing cold. You're in a fictitious land called Pine Land. And you're working with the local population. And a lot of these people are paid to help out special forces. They'll give you like, we stayed one night in a, in a, in a chicken coop, a big chicken coop that had the incubators and everything else in it. And the woman had a cow and she'd bring in pails of fresh milk for us. We couldn't build fires because we were in unconventional warfare. And I remember one night I slept in this abandoned house, old farmhouse, that had a front porch, and then it had a huge front window next to the, next to the door. Well, there was no glass in the window. There was no glass in any of the windows. And I was sleeping. I had my sleeping bag, my down sleeping bag, on the living room floor, right next to where half of the floor was gone. So you have that cold air coming up from, from the ground. I'm literally freezing to death, and it, at five o'clock in the morning, one of the guards woke me up, and it was my turn to go out and walk guard duty, and basically walk around the house. And, and by then, the guys are out there with their generators, their crank generators, calling in communications, because we had to make, make combo, combo at night, and we had to make combo in the daytime, early in the morning. So I'm out there walking around, and, and I was actually starting to warm up. I had taken my boots off when I climbed in my sleeping bag. But we didn't have real heavy clothing. I mean, we weren't, we're, I don't think we were wearing long underwear even. So you're, you're wearing cotton fatigue pants. And I'd taken my boots off, and I remember when I was standing there trying to put my boots on, I'm just, I'm literally shaking because of the cold. And um, so I, I walked the second guard duty. The next one would be the last one. And then we'd, everyone would wake up. We'd have a reveille. And so I walked two hours of guard duty so the last guy didn't have to walk in. Mm -hmm. nice. Have to get, have that experience to get out of that mm -hmm. warm sleeping bag. Mm -hmm. So anyway, after that, uh, I graduated. And then I was, um, then I went home for two weeks at Christmas. And then I came back and was assigned to, actually before I left, I was assigned to the 7th Special Forces Group, which was right there at Fort Bragg. So that will start my next phase and how I ended up going to Vietnam. Wonderful. Thank you so much.